Welcome back to Sustainable Land Management. Today we explore SLM under dry conditions. In our first class we looked at land degradation. In the second I took you on a guided tour of SLM in humid areas and urban situations too. Now we'll deal with the drier zones where every drop of water counts and therefore both technologies and approaches differ. We will begin by examining water harvesting for crop production, looking at three levels of scale, and then move on to rangeland management, where we'll consider the problems and various strategies that are being promoted. Sub-Saharan Africa is my geographical focus. Here's something we looked at in class two, the continuous variation in terms of water availability. Where it's the wettest, rainfall runoff will need to be carefully drained out of the system. Where there's only just enough water, then in situ moisture conservation is required. Where it's dry and irrigation is not possible, then water harvesting comes into play. And that's the focus today. Water harvesting in dry areas and then challenges connected to rangelands, which are often dry areas prone to desertification, fire and conflict between land users. In all dry zones, whether for crops or livestock, management of scarce water resources is crucial. Water harvesting is defined as the collection and concentration of rainfall runoff or floodwaters for plant production or other purposes. This is effective sustainable land management for dry areas, which combines production with conservation. There's huge potential for increases in yields, as well as reliability of production, and that's a form of resilience. This book shown on the left, Water Harvesting in Sub-Saharan Africa, covers most of the topics on today's menu. It was a follow-up to studies that I and my colleague Chris Ray undertook in the late 1980s for the World Bank. And WOCAT's book on the right here is an essential reference. Its scope is global and there are technical details and multiple case studies. Please study this diagram carefully. It is a conceptualization of how plants react to water at low levels of availability and shows how water harvesting can make all the difference when moisture levels are critical. Note especially the box in the center. A small increment in water availability can make all the difference between crop failure and at least some harvest. And now this diagram illustrates the proportion of rainfall that contributes directly to plant production in semi-arid Africa. That's the 15 to 30 percent which is transpired. Transpiration, by the way, is water that passes through plants for growth. That's what we want to happen. Deep drainage accounts for, well, perhaps 20 percent, which may then flow underground into rivers but most rainfall is effectively lost. Runoff may average 10 to 25%, and non-productive evaporation from the soil surface is an even greater amount. The numbers are just illustrative, but the principle is clear. Try to turn losses into productive transpiration that plants use to grow. So here's one winning strategy. Let's harvest and make use of this, that's runoff, which otherwise causes erosion and is water wasted. In turn, that will help reduce this, that's non-productive evaporation from the soil surface. And runoff will be used to increase this, that's productive transpiration used by grasses, crops and trees to grow. That's what we want to happen. You may recollect this photo. 
I used it before to explain how selective erosion damages land. But it also tells a story about losing precious rainfall through runoff in dry areas where water is the primary limiting factor to plant growth. This picture speaks for itself, as I hope many of the pictures in this course do. By capturing runoff, we actually collect a bounty of organic matter and plant nutrients in eroded soil too, when water is harvested and infiltrates. Now this is typical of what is left on the soil surface. Water harvesting is simultaneously nutrient harvesting. V-shaped microcatchments are often used for tree planting. The seedling or seedlings are planted on an earth step behind the hole where runoff water collects. Unfortunately, the tree planted in this example is a type of prosopis. Within 20 years, these trees had spread and become invasive. We will be discussing this later in class four. Water harvesting is reputedly as old as agriculture itself. Here are olives being grown in arid areas of Tunisia. Runoff, when it occurs, and that's not often, is carefully collected from hillsides and channeled to the trees where they use it for productive transpiration, in other words, for their growth. One way of classifying water harvesting is into runoff harvesting or rainwater harvesting and floodwater harvesting. And then runoff harvesting can be split into two subcategories microcatchments and external catchments. So what is the difference between these two main types of runoff harvesting? Basically, microcatchment systems have a series of small catchments between planted strips or small ponds as we've seen for trees. External catchment systems, on the other hand, have a single large catchment feeding a single cultivated area. Each of the two systems has its own characteristics, its advantages and disadvantages. Microcatchment systems are inherently more efficient because a greater proportion of runoff is harvested. That's because it has less distance to travel and therefore less chance to infiltrate into the catchment area. But farmers may not like large spaces between crop lines. External catchment systems, on the other hand, can sometimes yield a crop from a single runoff event. But they need spillways, and there's a danger of waterlogging if too much rainfall is harvested. OK, let's start by looking at microcatchment systems in more detail. Here, a series of microcatchments have been constructed by hand in Gujarat, India. The seedlings are not yet established but the system is clearly collecting runoff effectively. Here's an example of a microcatchment system called half moons or demi lune in French. This is popular in the West African Sahel, where the half moons are put to use for sorghum or millet production. That's on the bottom left. Or alternatively for grass, bottom right. I came across something very similar in China a few years back. It could be an example of what I tend to call parallel development of the same idea. In Burkina Faso, the most common system of water harvesting comprises hand-dug zai. Those are deep and wide planting pits, often used in combination with semi-permeable stone lines along the contour. Each side captures runoff, and that's where the seed and the manure are placed. 
Contour ridges are another example of microcatchment water harvesting. The ridges are marked out along the contour and dug by hand at a spacing of one and a half to two metres. The spaces between the ridges act as catchments and these feed the crops with runoff which collects in the furrows. And the crops are planted on the ridges where they benefit from the extra water. And now some technical detail of what happens to runoff under a contour ridge system after rainfall. It's from a profile cut into the soil. The top line is the soil surface. One of the lines below traces how deep the water has infiltrated. It is marked the wetting front. There's another line marked expected depth of wetting front, which shows how deep the water would have infiltrated if it had been even. But it's not even. The hatched area shows how much more water has infiltrated below the ridge and the furrow. This is because of runoff captured. The average soil water available in this run-on area is effectively 160% of the rainfall that has fallen. The crop benefits hugely. Mechanisation of ridges and furrows along the contour has been tried in the Sahel. I first saw this in Niger in 1988. The Valorani system is currently making an impact in Jordan. Here's an example of mechanised water harvesting for olive production in Syria. You can read more detail about this in the WOCAT book of 2007. OK, we've looked at micro catchments. Now we'll look at external catchments in a bit of detail. Here's an example of an external catchment system from Somalia in this case. Wherever there is a need to grow crops in dry areas where rainfall is inadequate, farmers tend to come up with the same basic idea, water harvesting, although the practices differ from country to country and region to region. In external catchment systems, Water from a catchment outside a field is captured and held in one planting area. In many examples there are spillways for excess water in the bottom bund. And even in cross-slope bunds within the fields, these help to spread the water better. In Tigray, northern Ethiopia, there are initiatives to collect runoff from hillsides in large infiltration ponds in the foot slopes. The result is a replenished water table on the plain below, and this can be witnessed by the vigorous regeneration of the indigenous and valuable Fiderbia albida tree. You remember the fertilizer tree that we've talked about already. Road drainage is a problem in many countries. Either the road isn't drained well, or the drains themselves cause erosion. So why not capture road runoff and use it productively? Bottom right is an example from Uganda of road runoff captured in a pond to water bananas. The terrace system of water harvesting in Sudan is entirely traditional. Despite the apparently flat land, there is runoff to be captured. By the way, do not confuse the Arabic word terrace with terrace that we've talked about in our last class. And here is a profile of the impact on crop growth. Sorghum is the crop of choice, as it is drought resistant, yet also tolerates inundation. And if it dries out, it can be fed to livestock. This all makes sense to the cultivators who are generally agro-pastoralists. They herd cattle, but grow some crops opportunistically as well. Revisiting the same location 20 years later, 
they found the terrace system was expanding. Farmers were being helped through the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources. I've mentioned stone lines in Burkina Faso already. They have the impact of slowing runoff from an outside catchment, and the water can then settle in the Zai planting pits. After the first rains, before planting, the effect of the stone lines on runoff is clear. Note the planting pits, the Zai, from the year before. They will need to be redug to increase their capacity before planting. Oh, and by the way, can you see the agroforestry? You remember that from our last class. My former colleague Paul Smith shared these photos with me. A hillside in arid northern Kenya sheds runoff, and this is channeled by a handmade stone diversion into a field below. After rain, that field, which is surrounded by an earth and stone bund, captures and holds runoff. After just a single flood, there may be enough water to grow a crop, like cowpeas, on residual moisture. Here's a local initiative on a household scale. Aseri, a widow in southwest Uganda, has utilised runoff from her roof by channeling it into her bananas. In eastern Kenya, many farmers have developed their own types of road runoff systems. Here, the farmer diverts water from his road into a tank and then pumps water out to irrigate his vegetables and his fruits. And now in India, farm ponds are common in the drier parts of the country. They capture runoff from tracks and roads and sometimes from the fields themselves. Increasingly, diesel pumps are used to irrigate the land. External catchments can be created from natural features in the landscape itself. For example, rocky outcrops provide runoff and can hold the water when a stone barrier or a low dam wall is constructed. This is a common system in eastern parts of Kenya. And here's another example of a rock catchment. While on holiday in Lanzarote, my wife pointed it out to me. A hillside cleared to lead water to a holding tank close by a farmhouse. As already noted, water harvesting can be subdivided into runoff harvesting, which is what we've been focusing on, and flood water harvesting. It's simply a question of scale. Flood water harvesting, or spate irrigation, is common in what we call the Horn of Africa, including Sudan, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Here's an example from Sudan. A wadi is a watercourse that carries flood flow just a few times a year. Here its flow is deflected by this huge stone pitched, that means stone covered, barrier. And the blue line shows its new direction downslope. This plain is where the flood waters are used for crops. It's the dry season now, but you can just see some earth buns which help to spread and hold the water. So today we've looked at water harvesting under micro catchments, moved on to external catchments and we've been talking about flood water harvesting. Now we'll have a quick look at agronomic aspects before moving on to a success story from West Africa. Of course, agronomy of crops under water harvesting needs to be carefully managed. Often, indigenous cereals such as sorghum and millet are best suited, and also drought evasive, rapidly maturing legumes such as cowpeas. Opportunism is a key strategy in both crop and livestock management in dry zones. Cowpeas, so called, 
are a drought-tolerant legume, and both the seeds and the leaves can be eaten. Excuse this rather poor quality photo of mine, it's from Kenya in the early 1980s. And now on to that success story that I promised you. More people, more trees. That was the name of a follow-up research project to check on 20 years of progress in two African projects. Here I am interviewing a project officer, Mathieu Wadrogo, who guided a community of water harvesting in Burkina Faso. In 2009, we now had the modern technology of laptops and DVDs, which we took to the field in order to show people the 1990 video. Many had actually never seen the original. Where there had been degraded land, in fact desertification, by forming stone lines, digging xi planting pits and protecting the area, a process of transformation was triggered. And here's the evidence, captured in a module of a DVD and a booklet in both English and French. A success story of environmental recovery. And the title captures one key element. Despite the population being higher, there are now more trees being nurtured by local farmers themselves under agroforestry systems. So today we've been through water harvesting for crop production. We started with micro catchments, moved on to external catchments, and we've been talking about flood water harvesting. Now it's time for rangeland management. So moving on from crop production, we must recognize that rangelands cover most of the dry lands in Africa and other continents too. They are not appreciated enough for their significant role as ecosystems with impacts on biodiversity and hydrology. Simultaneously, rangelands are huge reservoirs of carbon. But there are multiple problems of land degradation. There are also many different views and strongly held opinions on what constitutes the best answer. For what we hope is a balanced discussion, please see WOCAT's 2019 publication, featured here at the bottom of this slide. Traditional ecologists and rangeland managers hold the view that carrying capacity, the number of livestock per unit area, can be simply calculated and should be adhered to. But a relatively new school of thought says, no, rangelands are a non-equilibrium system. That is, they're unpredictable and opportunistic strategies are actually better. But be in no doubt that desertification is real, and it's a scourge of the rangelands, very widespread. This is a picture I took in Burkina Faso. Remember, on this sort of land, even when the rain does fall, the vegetation scarcely recovers. The debate about the future of the rangelands, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, has a central dilemma. If pastoralists maximise their stock numbers, the land suffers during droughts. But they manage to save enough livestock to recover their herds when conditions bounce back. Economically, it makes sense to them. Now, we've just talked about two schools of thought regarding grazing regimes. One that holds that the stocking rate or carrying capacity can be specifically calculated, and the other being that land should be simply used opportunistically. Here now are examples of these two models. First, a ranch in South Africa with a calculated stocking rate. Excellent cattle and good range conditions but it supports merely a very few ranches and supplies only a high-end market. Second, rangeland managed by a Samburu community in northern Kenya. 
large herds of cattle which make optimal use of vegetation in good years through both grazing of grasses but also browsing of bush however in poor years there is land degradation and livestock loss In Namibia, I witnessed a meeting of a grazing association which was attempting to draw a compromise. Limits to livestock herds were being negotiated. Could this be a key to progress? One of the biggest current challenges in the rangelands is invasive alien plant species. Now here's a picture of a development initiative that went all wrong. The prosopis tree, originally from southern USA and Mexico, was planted widely in East Africa in the 1980s, but it ran riot, and by the 2010s it had colonised huge areas. Nevertheless, there are examples of where it has been brought under control. One is here in Baringo, Kenya. But the problem is still very widespread and is endangering rangelands throughout the region. On a small scale, you will always find examples of innovative groups or individuals making progress in the rangelands. Here in Uganda's cattle corridor, a group has enclosed lamb for rehabilitation and is encouraging the spread of a stoloniferous grass from cattle kraals, that is overnight pens, where it grows strongly in the deep manure. I will just mention the use of fire in rangelands. It's another hot topic for debate. It may help eradicate unwanted thorny shrubs, but it also leaves the soil bare and vulnerable. And, of course, it converts carbon in the land to carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas. You can read about the use of fire in rangelands in WOCAT's 2019 book, But beware, the danger of wildfires is spreading dramatically with climate change. In the same book, you can also study the role of water in rangelands. From the rangelands, huge contribution as a reservoir of water resources in its wetlands and its rivers to the strategic use of water points as a tool in grazing management. And finally, a summary of take home messages. Once again, probably have noted these and others yourselves. Next time, we'll look at biodiversity and ecosystems. That's in class four. Thanks for listening. See you then.